Hi, this is Jeremy, and welcome to our audio version of our popular blog post, Tools and Techniques for Scalable Data Processing in Industrial IoT. This article is also available in the original form as a blog post, but also on Spotify and YouTube. You will fin find those in the description. So, let's get started. The industry is shifting from use cases to being technology driven. In this blog post, at the beginning of 2022, we provided a look behind the United Manufacturing Hub and into our experiences for tools and techniques for scalable data processing. If you do not know it yet, the United Manufacturing Hub is an open source toolkit to build your own reliable and secure industrial IoT platform. We've been working since 2017 in the field of data processing in industrial IoT and manufacturing. We began with a naive send all data to the cloud approach and through various industry projects involved into a helm chart for Kubernetes, bringing the world's IT into the hands of the engineer. This article is focused on our experiences with the tools and technologies we encountered on the way the reasons we landed up with the current architecture of the United Manufacturing Hub and where we are currently working on. It is split into three phases and these phases are typically also the ones that a lot of companies are going through. We will link to publicly available use cases whenever possible. So, the first phase is sending all data to the cloud. The second phase that we went through and a lot of companies are going through is the federated MQTT stream processing slash unified namespace. We worked with that and we think a lot of companies are also going for that. And now we have a third phase, the MQTT with Kafka based stream processing. So let's start with the first phase, sending all data to the cloud. This approach is often the first approach that companies take on Industry 4.0 or the Industrial IoT. It comes from the field of IoT and involves sending all data points directly into the cloud for later data analysis. The typical marketing story goes like this. Just connect all your devices just to the cloud and suddenly everything is good. Um, typically what's behind it is you have a lot of devices, you have a proprietary message broker, which is typically based on Apache Kafka. You then apply some stream analytics, which stores the data then in the data like, like S3. And then you put some analytics on top of it, like Power BI or Tableau. Typical tools used here is, for example, management message brokers, like Azure IoT Hub or AWS IoT Core or self-hosted MQTT brokers like Verna MQ or Hive MQ or Mosquito, which then run on Azure or AWS. Other tools are, for example, cloud-based databases and stream processing tools like Amazon DynamoDB, AWS Lambda or Azure Functions. One of our biggest challenges was that this architecture made certain use cases impossible, such as machine learning directly at the machine, because internet connections are often not suitable, for example, latency and up and downstream limitations, and it was therefore not possible to use a cloud broker. Some data just needs to be handled on the edge. Furthermore, this type of architecture strongly encouraged coupling. This means that it makes maintenance and the integration of new use cases much more difficult. It is hard to reuse the PLC data if the PLC directly writes into a cloud database. Additionally, multiple customers reported that the IT departments lack transparency about where the data is coming from and struggled making sense of the mostly raw data in the cloud. 
Most machines in factories are very different from each other and the raw data mirrors exactly that. Now, imagine that the production plant is in Europe, the server sits somewhere in the US, maybe on the west side, and now you're an analytics expert on the east side of the US, and now you have to make sense out of this data. It will be pretty difficult also because there are time zones in between, it is hard to talk to the production supervisor or the analytics expert, and it's really hard to make sense out of the data. There are solutions out there promising to make the contextualization across machines in factories fully automated. But until now, we have not heard yet from any customer in discrete manufacturing that this actually works. And even if it works, there are still limitations regarding certain use cases that we've talked about before. Because of that feedback, we and other companies like BMW decided to take a different approach and solve these challenges. Let's get into the next phase, the federated MQTT stream processing slash unified namespace. We call this approach federated MQTT stream processing. Other names for it are, for example, unified namespace, message bus, or event-driven architecture. Here, the data is not sent directly from the producers to the consumers, but a so-called message broker is interposed. This adds another component and thus increases the likelihood of a system failure. But on the other hand, and this is a big plus, it makes it easier to integrate new machines, services, solutions or databases. So, let's take a look and repeat. You have multiple producers, they all send their messages to a message broker and then you have consumers at the top who subscribe to it and then do something with the data. Additionally, instead of having one central message broker, we decided to go for one for each factory. This enables not only factories working independently from the cloud, but also enables all use cases we can think of in manufacturing, for example, like edge computing. As message broker, we chose, because of their popularity and simplicity, MQTT, Message Queue Telemetry Transport Protocol. MQTT is great to handle millions of devices at the same time while still being relatively simple. Especially if you compare that to protocols like OPC UA. We would then gather data from production machines, put it into an MQTT broker, contextualize it on the edge using multiple microservices and then send it to the cloud MQTT broker where the data would automatically be stored in a database. This architecture provides the following advantages. First, independence from internet outages. The production is not disturbed and can continue to operate. Second, data transparency. It is easy to see which data is available. And third, decoupling. It is easy to integrate new use cases as you can then just plug them into the MQTT broker. We went with this approach for almost three years until we realized two road blockers when scaling this architecture. Let's go into the first road blocker. MQTT is not designed for full tolerant and scalable stream processing. Stream processing is the part where you take data out of the broker, you process it and then you push the results back to the broker. The architecture we talked about struggles with the edge cases. For example, hard device restarts. For example, when they lose power, which then can cause a queue corruption. You can have duplicated messages caused by problems in the network or messages not processed at all or lost because 
certain microservices were overloaded and the microservice needed to restart. Or, and this can also happen, a combination of all the previous elements happening at the same time, Murphy's Law. Let's make the thing a little bit more clearly. Here is an example. Imagine we want to determine the output quantity of a machine and then the data comes in via late barrier. The photoelectric sensors measures the distance and when the distance gets smaller, a product is passing by and a message count is sent to the MQTT broker. There is now also a microservice B that calculates the output quantity from these count messages, for example, produce pieces last hour. An implementation for microservice B usually looks like this. First, it subscribes to the topic of the count messages. Then, the current output quantity is stored in the program and, if necessary, it is retained in the MQTT broker. The count message is taken, the number of produced products is extracted and the current output quantity is increased. And as a last step, the current output quantity is now sent back to the MQTT broker. But what happens now if there are some messages in front of B and B receives 10 messages at once and then crashes, maybe because of any other reason? If Microsoft's B is now restarted, these 10 messages would be lost because microservice B has already received them. These cases are very unlikely, but the probability is never zero. Once you connect hundreds of devices, the probability increases and you start noticing them. And suddenly, you spend most of your time just trying to cover these edge cases in code with redundancy, more queues and more lines of code. And the implementation of these edge cases is something that large companies like Netflix, they are still working on to get it properly working. This is not easy stuff here. There are of course two options on how you can work around with that with MQTT. One approach is to mitigate the issues in the previously mentioned examples using queues. We did that. We tried that. What we did was we first pushed all incoming messages into a level DB database and wrote them to disk. Then each message is read again from the level DB database. Unfortunately, we should have taken a look at Wikipedia first because LevelDB has a history of database corruption, especially during hard device restarts. These hard device restarts are way more common on the top floor than you would get in protected server farms. This resulted in data loss when doing frequent device restarts. You could also then switch to a log-based queues, so databases writing everything into an append-only log. But then, one would be reprogramming Apache Kafka and we will come to that also in the next chapter. Another approach is to acknowledge MQTT messages only if these messages have already been processed successfully. Another approach is to acknowledge MQTT messages only if these messages have already been processed successfully. Should a crash then occur, the MQTT broker with the correct implementation would send the message again. However, there are three disadvantages here. First, it's kind of intuitive, it is an unsupported workaround. The MQTT standard clearly states that the messages should be acknowledged as soon as the message was received. I'm quoting from the standard now, from the MQTT v3.1.1 standard. There are three qualities of services for message delivery. Da -da -da. At least once where messages are assured to arrive but duplicates can occur. 
Second, it significantly reduces the possible throughput as the maximum amount of in-flight MQTT messages is always limited. And the third disadvantage are unstable implementations. Theoretically, this resending of the messages should be possible when using quality of service of MQTT. For example, quality of service 1, which means at least once delivery. However, the MQTT standard does not provide a solution on how this should be implemented. So, all the implementations now are then left to the creators of each MQTT library and broker. You can take a look here, you can find information on this on Stack Overflow or even uh, Power MQTT for Golang has an undocumented version. Which, by the way, doesn't seem to work. This topic of the unstable implementations brings us also to our next big chapter. The second big road blocker when implementing this type of architecture. The open source MQTT ecosystem is mostly focused on small use cases. We have also found that parts of the open source MQTT ecosystem, brokers and client libraries are unreliable in larger constellations. And we have heard this from other vendors working in this area as well. We're not saying that all solutions are unreliable, just so that it's sometimes very difficult to see the limits of the individual systems. Just giving you some examples that we've encountered in our past years. So there are, for example, large MQTT libraries like Power MQTT, which do not reconnect after disconnect, or they simply hang up for unknown reasons. It sounds crazy, and when I talk to people, they don't believe it, but then you take a look at the library, you work with it, and then you agree with it. It's quite crazy. People who still use it are using workarounds. For example, and this is not a joke, Typical workarounds include sending a message back and forth to the server. And if no message arrives within X minutes, the entire client is restarted. This then prevents the hanging up part. Another example, um, or another example. We did a test with MQTT bridges from various vendors and we were seeing a 30 to 80% message loss. When we did the bridge, we set it up, we then um, artificially disconnected the Ethernet, the internet connection, and then after a couple of minutes, we also disconnected the power supply. From all the bridges that we tested, none of them were able to actually store the data and we had a really high message loss here, which then caused us to write our own MQTT bridge, but this is a different topic. Another example of the, that it's relied, that it's mostly focused on small use cases, that the client libraries, they're not buffering messages during downtimes. So if the broker is down, they just throw an error message, but they say that they buffer it, so it's kind of unexpected behavior. You also have the issue, especially in hardware devices, that the MQTT standard is only partially implemented. Or, and I'm again not joking here, that you have, um, you have managed MQTT services from large cloud providers. And if you take a look at them, especially on at the product of one large cloud provider, you realize that they're not able to handle more than 10,000 messages per second. We really didn't expect that when we went into the open source MQTT ecosystem, but that were the issues that we experienced. This list can then be continued indefinitely. We first tried to solve the problems by introducing workarounds. I mean, it's a small issue, so let's just do a quick workaround. And then we just put up additional queues. And 
we worked and worked and suddenly the system was way more complex than we expected. And complexity makes the system also prone to errors and malfunctions. One note here at this point is that you should also be aware of commercial black box one fits it all solutions praising how seamless MQTT works on their site. Especially if they just put a black box around it, it's very likely that they might just use the same open source libraries and brokers, but they just white label them. There are commercial MQTT brokers out there, for example HiveMQ, with their own custom written brokers and client libraries, which might help mitigate some of the issues mentioned before. Let's summarize the road blockers with this type of architecture. With this type of architecture using MQTT and the unified namespace. MQTT is designed for the safe message delivery between devices and it is not designed for reliable stream processing. Additionally, parts of the open source MQTT ecosystem and all vendors that are building on top of it are unreliable. We worked with it for a couple of years. We introduced more and more workarounds, but we were still struggling with reliability. So we needed a different approach. And we needed an approach that is already ideally used in the industry and is considered best practice. Let's go to the third phase, MQDT with Kafka-based stream processing. So, we took a look at how large companies in insurance, automotive and banking are solving these challenges. One of the best practices we found is to use Apache Kafka. I'm now quoting their website. Apache Kafka is an open source distributed event streaming platform used by thousands of companies for high-performance data pipelines, streaming analytics, data integration, and mission-critical applications. Based on their own statements, more than 80% of all Fortune 100 companies trust and use Kafka. So, how does it work? The principle is very similar to the one of an MQTT broker. So first you have consumers and producers, both are also called clients, with a broker in the middle. Messages are called in Kafka terminology, they are called events, and are published by a producer to a topic, and can then be consumed by another microservice. The difference here is that each event gets written into a lock to disk first. This sounds like a very small detail at the beginning, but because of that small detail, Kafka can guarantee you message ordering, zero message loss, and efficient exactly once processing, even in the harshest environments. So, how do we use Kafka in the United Manufacturing Hub? So what we did is we used an MQTT broker to gather data from various devices across the shop floor. Then we bridge it to Kafka to contextualize and continuously process it. With this approach we are combining both the strengths of MQTT and Kafka. And so far it looks very good, even when hundreds of thousands of messages per second are sent through unreliable devices and networks. If a microservice fails, then all messages are reliably cached by Kafka. And we are not the only ones. As I said at the beginning, we always want to link to use cases whenever they're possible. And in the description you will find that companies like Edifion, they moved entirely away from MQDT and they switched fully to Kafka. Other companies like BMW, they use Kafka as we do it in parallel to MQTT. 
We talked with Kai Vena from Confluent and he provided us even with more examples. I'm quoting now. Apache Kafka and MQTT are a perfect combination for many IoT use cases. The integrated deployment enables data streaming from the last mile of the OT world into real-time, near-real-time and batch applications in the IT infrastructure. A great example is BADA, a worldwide manufacturer of innovative machinery for the food processing industry. BADA runs an IoT-based and data-driven food value chain on serverless Confluent Cloud. The single source of truth in real-time enables business-critical operations for tracking, calculations, alerts, etc. MQTT provides connectivity to machines and vehicles at the edge. Kafka Connect connectors integrate MQTT and other IT systems such as Elasticsearch, MongoDB and AWS S3. KSQLDB processes the KSQLDB processes the data in motion continuously. Like I said, more information you can find in the description here. But we're also, if we take a look at Kafka, we're using additional functionalities here, and additional features. For example, we have message compression enabled by default. And additionally, we also append tracing information. What does it mean, adding tracing information? We add information about where was the message created, where is it coming from, what were the errors when processing it, and we put it into the Apache Kafka headers. If at any step of the data processing pipeline a message fails to be processed, it gets stored automatically in a different putback error queue. This then helps in troubleshooting malformed messages and keeps the main processing pipeline clear. Furthermore, it promotes transparency as one can now see where which data point is coming from. We are also able to treat messages differently depending on their importance. For example, all business relevant information like new orders or produced parts should go through a high integrity pipeline. In the high integrity pipeline, we guarantee at least once delivery. Compared to that, process values such as temperatures pass through the high throughput pipeline where we deactivated the this guarantee, this at least once delivery guarantee for performance reasons. If you want to have more information, take a look at the description. You will find there a link to learn.umh.app where we have posted more information. Now, one of the final questions. So, why are we even using MQTT and why did we not switch entirely to Kafka? Two reasons for that. First, MQTT is really simple and therefore it is easy to gather data on the shop floor. If we leave it out, we would miss on a huge opportunity to easily get data from the automation world. Second reason, and this is now a note when I'm recording this, we published this article originally in the beginning of 2022. Now we have more information about this. So what we wrote here is that Node-RED only works very stable with MQTT and that we wa don't want to move out Node-RED because we haven't found a user-friendly alternative for it yet. And this is only true because we haven't really found a user-friendly alternative for it but we found a method to use Kafka together with Node-RED. So this is only partially true anymore. So let's take a look at what we're doing right now. So right now we're finishing up the transition by transforming this core infrastructure. So all our important microservices. 
for example, a sensor connect which fetches data from IFM and MyOlink masters, and we change them to use Kafka instead of MQTT. Additionally, we are moving as many standard elements out of the MQTT-based Node-RED into more reliable microservices based on Kafka. One example of it would be that we are now using Benthos for reliable stream processing. So, that was it. So, at this point, we thank Mark Jekle from Maibon Wolf and Kai Wehner from Confluent for the valuable feedback in creating this article. Thank you for listening.